The thing is, you need to mentor your laptop better. <laughs> well, we just met three weeks ago when my new employer handed her over to me. I don't think we've really bonded yet. She's still trying to figure me out. She's like, you wake me up at all these odd hours. You never really send me flowers or those chocolates. Also, there's a talker here in the room about mentoring, so you should have that. Oh, excellent. Have you been reading my slides? You would get things done much faster that way. Okay. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, everyone. Sorry for the problem. It needed partial reboot of some part of um, um, I have something to ask before we start. Please do whatever you can with your cell phones, not to let them go off during the talk. You're having real difficulties of the cell phones. And there should be a break or something we can throw, but we don't have. So I ask you, please do something with your cell phones, whatever you think will be appropriate. Um, we are here with um, Leslie Hottern, and she has like three paragraphs of biography and experience and being awesome, so I just go um, just to paper. Oh, sorry. She has over 10 years of experience in high-tech project management, marketing, and public relations, and she currently works as an open source outreach manager for Oregon State University's open source lab. So I'm not going through the rest of it. You can find it online. And um, we are having a talk on mentoring. We're doing it wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, before I get started, I would like to take a moment to thank the organizers of LCA as well as all of our sponsors for helping us be here together. Uh, and also a great big thank you to all the folks who helped me uh, with the preparation for this talk, including reviewing my abstract, Mary, Jacinta, Deb, and someone who I just forgot, so I'm a bad person. Um, <clears throat> before I actually get into the meat of this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about my background in an uh, effort to frame the overall message of this presentation. So uh, first, just really quickly, there's actually an errata in my bio. I have recently joined AppFog, which is a startup in Portland, Oregon, focusing on platform as a service. Um, this isn't actually directly relevant to what I'm talking about today, but they hired me because of my experience doing community management and open source mentoring. To tell you folks a little bit about the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, is anybody aware of the OSU OSL? That is way more hands than I was expecting to see. That's wonderful. Uh, for folks that have never heard of the OSU OSL, this is a group at Oregon State University in Oregon in the United States that does hosting for some of the world's best known open source projects like the Linux Foundation, Drupal, the Apache Software Foundation. Um, over a hundred open source projects are hosted at the Open Source Lab, most of them free of charge. Uh, in addition to doing this hosting, an integral part of the operations of the OSU OSL is actually a mentoring program for student interns who get hands-on work experience doing systems administration and software development, either for homegrown open source projects at the lab or in service for the open source lab's clients. Um, our students are highly sought after. Uh, they go to work at Fortune 100 companies. They found startups that get acquired and are <coughs> part of, uh, you guys, Y Combinator. Those guys, everybody's very excited about them. Um, shameless plug, if you ever feel like charitable giving, the OSU OSL could use your support. Prior to working at the OSU OSL, I was at Google in their open source programs office where I was working on these two programs, Summer of Code and the Google Code In. Are folks in the audience familiar with these? Excellent. Just a quick recap for those who are not. Um, Google Code In is a contest because you can't put together a program for pre-university students uh, according to global law. Don't ever get involved in contest law, it's not pleasant. Um, <clears throat> this, the idea here is to introduce pre-university students to open source development in a variety of ways, everything from documentation, marketing, bug fixes, etc. The Summer of Code is focused on, surprisingly enough, code, and a stipend is paid to students to do a three-month project over the um, Northern Hemisphere summer, shall we say. So, uh, this is just to say I've had a lot of experience working in FOSS mentoring programs, but that's not actually really the impetus for why I wanted to come and give this talk today. Um, and actually, that starts during my university days. Um, I actually studied medieval English literature at UC Berkeley. Uh, the lovely woman pictured at the top here is Professor Ann Middleton, and I was her undergraduate research apprentice. 
Uh, this is a pretty prestigious program where you get to work directly with a tenured professor, often um, with an emeritus professor, as an undergraduate doing a research project. And I basically spent an awful lot of time talking to Professor Middleton about Chaucer and William Langland and Piers Plowman. And this is the part where usually everyone's uh, eyes glaze over because no one cares about medieval lit like most of the time when you talk to your friends about all that computer stuff you do and their eyes glaze over. Yeah. So I'm actually a failed mentee. My professor spent about 20 hours of her life talking to me about the importance of the 14th century English law courts and how that informed the creation of secular literature, uh, Middle English literature, Chaucer, etc. And my contributions to the scholarly corpus of medieval English literature are precisely zero. So I am myself a failed mentee and I work with a lot of folks who are in mentoring programs who are constantly lamenting their failed mentees. <clears throat> Typical complaints about mentoring and FOSS programs. Um, we're working very, very hard to get people more actively involved in the project, and they don't stick around long term. Uh, perhaps it's easier to just do it yourself rather than try to help get someone else to do, uh, do it and become better educated to do it later. Um, people feel like the return on investment is fairly poor from some mentoring programs. Um, an off-sided figure is about 25% of mentees actually go on to become long-term contributors, and that doesn't necessarily seem like the best odds. I don't know if you folks had an opportunity to review the abstract before the talk, but uh, Dave Neary of G the GNOME Project penned an excellent post in May of last year, basically on how mentoring programs fail. And he made a lot of excellent points, including but not limited to um, communication difficulties, duration of projects. It's actually an incredibly good read, and I would totally check it out, and I've made a shortened URL if you'd like to look at it. And essentially the conclusion was, based on both his own findings, some anecdotal evidence, and a talk given by a gentleman named Graham Percival, who had created something called the Great Documentation Project. And he basically decided that he wanted to stop contributing to a project called Lily Pond, which is to create sheet music. And so he thought he would find people to replace him. And he decided he was going to dedicate an entire year to doing nothing but mentoring. And his conclusion at the end of the year, based on the number of people who stuck around and continued contributing, was not only that it would have been faster to do it himself, but in fact he was now even further behind because he'd taken that time to mentor. Which leads me to the question, why are we doing this at all if it seems like we're not getting the return on investment that we're seeking when we mentor? So, and I'd like to thank Jacinta Richardson for pointing this out to me. Um, if you ever actually search Google for good conversion rates and um, hold your nose while you read a bunch of SEO marketing happiness, you'll notice that it's cited that a good conversion rate, people actually choosing to become a customer, 2% is a great conversion rate. In fact, some folks will talk about marketing campaigns that had a conversion rate as high as 18%, and then the next couple paragraphs down you'll see, in fact, people think that maybe those numbers were fudged or somehow incorrect. So when we talk about mentoring programs and we're talking about a 25% return on investment working with mentees as being too low, it's probable that we might need to reset our expectations on that. However, one of the best points that came out of this discussion that Dave and Graham were having online was there is a need to pre-qualify those whom you wish to mentor. Obviously, um, you want to be available to folks, but there needs to be some process for working through whether or not it'll be a good investment of your time. So I would like to share with you my strategy. And my strategy is called Everyone Gets Tacos. Um, I really like tacos, and there are a lot of folks who come to me looking for sage advice or just to pick my brain about uh, different things. And if I can meet up with them in person, the rule is we go for tacos. I get to enjoy delicious tacos, and no matter how inane the conversation may be, I have at least enjoyed a delicious taco. And usually the conversation isn't inane, which is quite good. Um, and one of the great things about this is it allows me to be highly available. Um, I think that one of the most important things to realize is we're thinking through, you know, scheduling our lives. We're all extremely busy people. We all have a lot of different demands on our time. And yet, we're also those who are most knowledgeable in a variety of different subject areas. So making yourself as highly available as you possibly can be is a good and noble goal. Um, I've at times set office hours. Uh, both for students that I've worked with at the lab and just in general, um, when I'm really, you know, overwhelmed. It's like I have between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. Pacific time on Friday, and if you need me, you come to me then. 
or uh, <clears throat> one of my former interns has come to me as a mentee for advice and he called me right before I was leaving for LCA and he said, so I need something and I said, you have 10 minutes, go. And uh, actually that worked out quite well. So the idea here, while you're making yourself available, is not to make yourself too available. You want to effectively pre-qualify whether or not the person that you're spending your time with is actually going to be a good use of that time. And I absolutely think that this is the best idea ever. And you might even be able to get them to buy you tacos, which is great. Um, I usually find that the best thing to do is to set a follow-up task and then see if someone actually follows up on that task. This could be anything from, oh, you'd like some help with your resume, that's great. Take a look at these three websites and polish up your resume before you send it to me. Because inevitably someone sent you their resume asking for review. If I notice no changes, sorry, don't have time to review it. Right? So I'm not suggesting that you want to simply make yourself completely available to the entire world, but I am making the argument that we need to reframe how we think about mentoring a bit. So every time I talk to folks about why they want to do mentoring in FOSS projects, they all say the same thing. Their goal is they want to get and retain new contributors. Who doesn't think this is a good idea? Well, very good, why? <laughs> Are you just being contrarian? Okay, it's always enjoyable. Um, this is sort of the holy grail of FOSS mentoring programs, right? We're gonna find people and they're going to come into our project and they're gonna be great and they're going to get a lot of stuff done and that's wonderful. And the thing about the holy grail, folks, is the holy grail was really, really hard to find. That's why there was a legend about the holy grail. So, I really feel that, of course, you wanna get and retain new contributors to your project, that's wonderful. But I think that this being the ultimate goal of our thoughts about mentoring really completely misses the point. So newbies help you whether they stay in your project or not. Newbies are effectively your this sucks button. Away from the decision. Yes, sir. Newbies are effectively your this sucks button. They are the people who are around to tell you where all the flaws may be. Maybe it's in your documentation, uh, your communication practices, maybe it's the fact that there's never anyone in your IRC channel to ask questions. And simply letting you know that something sucks, even if they don't fix it, has great value. Uh, my friend Josh Gay uh, with the Free Software Foundation is actually the gentleman who coined the um, this sucks button phrase and basically said, I wish every free software project had a this sucks button on every page on their website so you just push this sucks and then we would know what we needed to improve. Even if the contributor or would-be contributor never improved it themselves. So granted, you're going to get some feedback about things that are suboptimal that's not really useful. If someone comes to you and says, well, it's very, very nice that you wrote this version control system and I think that's great, but I think you should have just been using CVS this entire time. Not helpful. Not helpful. But if someone says, you know, this is confusing and I became frustrated and I simply gave up after simply trying to install the software, that's valuable, right? There's a problem and that problem needs to be addressed. I also think that sometimes we tend to discount the simple power of having new ideas and new perceptions in our projects and how those shake up the status quo. Um, free software projects, it's usually a lot of friends working really, really hard together. When you hang out with your friends, you tend to hang out with people that think like you. Someone who doesn't think like you is going to reveal a lot to you about the assumptions that you make, how you approach problems, and they very well might completely shake up your approach entirely. Maybe not. But at least taking that time to be introspective about the decisions you're making how you're making them, why you're making them, in and of itself has value. So I'm going to take a moment to get meta. I think that some of the frustration that mentors and FOSS projects feel is simply that the problem is how we approach the problem. We're approaching the idea of mentoring through the lens of software development. How well is this code base going to scale? How well is my mentoring program going to scale? Uh, what's the return on investment for me for participating in this mentoring program? How can I automate away repetitive tasks in the mentoring process? Well, the best way to automate away repetitive tasks in the mentoring process is to tell people RTFM, and as we all know, that doesn't necessarily produce optimal results because it's not as, yes? If you're gonna say RTFM, you please give a reference because I've spent so much time going which manual. 
<laughs> I've actually, um, just to take a quick aside, I've actually had folks be critical of the idea of actually referencing the specific point in the documentation where a question is answered because you're teaching people to be dependent. I would like to take the opportunity to say no. I do not agree. You may do as you wish, but please do not do it near me. All right, so the problem is when we approach the concept of mentoring with these concepts in our head, we're going to inevitably meet with failure, right? People don't scale. You can't automate away having to answer the same question over and over again because newcomers will often have the same questions. And even if that question is answered in the documentation, which is fabulous, more often than not, and I, I love this, read the documentation. Where's the documentation? It's on the wiki. Where's the wiki? Oh yeah, maybe we should put a link to the wiki on our website. That would be great, because we all just type, you know, wiki. Da, 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 da. So it's difficult to, to actually make sure that you can transmit that information if it's not accessible. So I'm basically going to argue approaching mentoring through the lens of software development practice is going to meet with eternal fail and suggest other ways to approach the problem. So let's look at FOSS mentoring projects from the eyes of our would-be contributor. What do we tell people about why it's important to get involved in free software? You're going to learn how to use version control, and you're going to learn how to work in distributed teams, and you're going to get these amazing skills, and you're going to learn from some of the best people in the industry how to program, da 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 right? Awesome. Those are all great things. I've certainly made that argument myself. But what we're basically pitching our mentees on is the idea that by participating in FOSS projects, you're going to see a return on investment in terms of your career aptitude your ability to get a good job, your ability to be a successful programmer. The only problem is when that comes head to head with what mentors are actually looking for. So you have mentors who basically are trying very, very hard to make sure that they don't have to mentor anymore. They want someone to come along, get into the project, get up to speed, be incredibly effective, give them the opportunity to fix that bug that has been driving them crazy for the last three years if they could only get around to fixing it. And yet our mentees come in being sold on the idea that by participating in open source, you're gonna go work at some superstar stellar company. It's gonna be awesome. You're gonna get all these great skills. You're gonna retire on a tropical island at age 40. Everything's gonna be great. And notice that both of those are time delineated things, right? If I find a new contributor to contribute to the project, I'm going to have to worry less about finding new contributors or replacing myself. If I come in and participate in free software projects, I'm going to get all these skills that then I can go and apply to a completely different task that has nothing to do with the FOSS project that I'm participating in. There's a complete mismatch when we're talking about how we approach the problem from a return on investment perspective. So my big question of the day that I'd like to pose to all of you how many of you got involved in free software or in open source software because of the return on investment you were going to have through your participation? <laughs> I don't believe you, Dale. <laughs> um, I theorized that there would be one hand raised, but I didn't know it would be you. Really? <laughs> ROI? For a, very, for a very large and diffuse value of return. I think we're going to totally get into the very large and huge value of return. Um, so, Return on investment has absolutely nothing to do with what we're doing. None of us got involved in this because we thought, oh yes, it's great, I'm gonna get involved in FOSS because it's gonna give me all these great things. We got involved because we were passionate about it. Approaching the problem through the lens of, what am I gonna get out of this is ineffective. And to sort of drive the point home, reframing the argument, conference rule number one, be excellent to each other. I'd actually argue that that's life rule number one, frankly. Um, and notice that we don't say, we should be excellent to each other as long as there is sufficient return on investment. We should be excellent to each other as long as it scales. We should be excellent to each other as long as I get something out of it, right? Yeah, no. Mentoring is good for the sake of mentoring. So um, this is actually a quote attributed to Jesus Christ, but I've always thought that this was, in fact, the essence of the GPL. You receive free, give free. And I think that's particularly poignant when talking about mentoring, but I also think it's particularly poignant for us as a community, because I think it's very easy for all of us to forget our own privilege. Um, if we're sitting in this room, we're really intelligent folks. 
and native intelligence is actually privilege. Not everyone has that. And the fact that we have that privilege, I would argue, and the fact that we are a community that values freedom should be an impetus to us to help try and bring that freedom to others wherever we can. Does anybody know where this is from? Spider-Man! Because all you ever needed to know in life you could learn from superheroes. So, we have great freedom. We have free software. We have the freedom of our native intellect. Uh, in many ways, we have economic freedom because we work in an industry where pay scales are quite high compared to everybody else. We have the freedom of the connections that we all have with one another and how much that helps us to be able to accomplish because we are working together, because we have our friends and colleagues to assist us when we need it. And I will argue that it is absolutely accurate. With this freedom comes great responsibility. Um, we are very fortunate individuals. And because of that fortunate state, we should be contributing that fortunateness to other people. And mentoring is a great way to do that. The value of mentoring, I will argue, is not finding new contributors. The value of mentoring is spreading your value system. And I've listed what I think are several values for participating in free software here, but I also just wanted to illustrate with a point from my own life. Um, I learned about free software when I was about 20. And I learned about free software because I was over at a friend's house and the music stopped playing. And I said, oh, hey, you know, where's the stereo? And he said, oh, no, 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 just go and, uh, you know, turn it back on. It's a MP3 player. It's on the, you know, computer. Okay, great. So the display is dark. So I go over and wiggle the mouse. And there's this funky foot thing, which I have never seen before, and I have no idea what it is. And I'm quite convinced that I've actually broken something. And I go, well, so, so what is this foot? And he says, it's GNOME. I said, that's lovely. What is GNOME? And he then proceeded to explain in about two minutes, uh, because he was a systems administrator, and therefore somewhat terse, shall we say, um, <laughs> what free software was. You know, there are a bunch of developers, and they publish their source code online. Uh, everyone can make use of it. Uh, the concept of the GPL, sharing uh, with your neighbor, et cetera. And I didn't do anything with this knowledge for five to six years, but I absolutely remembered it. It took two minutes for me to be infected with the idea that this was the right way to live your life, that this was the right way to create software, that this was the right way for technology to be created and promulgated. And the fact of the matter is, you can share these values in two minutes. Your would-be new contributor might say, well, that's very nice. I was actually looking for something completely different. But explaining to them the value of freedom is something that I think will stay with them forever. The importance of influence is something that I think it's very, very easy to forget because it is literally immeasurable. We don't know what impact our actions will actually have immediately. And when we're thinking about ROI, we're thinking about things like quarterly balance sheets or annual revenue. We're not thinking about long term. We're not thinking about what the impact of our actions today on one particular individual may have as a ripple effect over time. And I would argue that not taking that view is actually very short-sighted. So false mentoring is a lab, not a business. Um, how many of you work for firms that have research and development departments? Excellent. Thank you. How many of you would say what percentage of your research and development projects actually meet with success? Is it 10%, 5%, 20%? Anybody? Go ahead. Pardon? Okay, so this gentleman is clearly an outlier. Would anyone like to <laughs> quote a statistic that won't be supportive of my argument? <laughs> But I love it when I get my way. All right, so back in the old days when everything was really good. <laughs> Go ahead, Josh. Would you uh, count the things that fail before they ever leave the inside of your head because you say, oh, wait, never mind. Mm -hmm. If so, like 1%? 1%. Um, 
So at least um, back in the, the glory days, the foggy days of yours, so maybe you know, 15 to 20 minutes ago, okay, five years ago, the idea of research and development investment was to do speculative things just for the sake of seeing what would come of them. If you think of anybody here into cars, any gearheads in the audience? Okay, so it's like, I think of it kind of like concept cars. No one actually ever expects to see most of the features in concept cars that end up at these big auto trade shows actually implemented in real automobiles. Sometimes they are, very often they're not. But simply going through that research and that creative process has value. And I would argue that rather than thinking about how we scale, what our return on investment is, we think of our mentoring process as a lab. What can we create here? And it may very well be that we're not creating anything, but it may very well be that we're creating something that has high value. So just to bring it all around and begin at the beginning, um, I told everyone that I am a failed mentee. Um, so Professor Middleton uh, is a Guggenheim Fellow. Uh, UC Berkeley is incredibly well funded. Um, a great deal of the work that I did for her consisted of spending a lot of time in the basement of the Bolt Hall Law, Law Library making a lot of photocopies. Um, I read an awful lot of English law tracts because when you're sitting there making hundreds and hundreds of photocopies, you get really bored. So due to my interest in 14th century English law, uh, after I left UC Berkeley in the middle of the dot-com nuclear winter in you know, May of 2000 when I thought, I'm going to go get a job in tech because I should make money because you know, the crash happened in April of 99 and I wasn't really paying attention because I was in academia. Learn from my fail, read the news. Um, you know, I actually managed to score a job at a communications semiconductor firm, which was wonderful. I was working for the vice president of business development. He happened to be a patent attorney. And because he was my boss and was a patent attorney, he had me working on all of our uh, patents and trademarks as part of my job duties. And because of this, I got an interest in intellectual property law. And because I had, you know, had this burgeoning interest in intellectual property law, I started learning about things like the EFF, for example. And okay, so great. Then I transitioned to Google, uh, where I start off in the recruiting organization. And because I have this interest in IP stuff and I know about this kind of open sourcey thing and I'm a little bit nerdier maybe than some of my recruiter colleagues, um, I was asked to recruit for all the teams that were involved with open source stuff. The Linux kernels folks, uh, the Firefox engineering team at that time. So that was great. And because I was working, recruiting for open source positions, eventually I was recruited into the open source programs office where I then became responsible for the Summer of Code program. So, Again, the ripple effect. You never know what your inputs are going to result from, or, or what outputs will result from your inputs. So finally, I'd leave you guys with a question. Did my professor waste her time? No. I would argue that she didn't waste her time. Um, I haven't talked to her in years. In fact, when I was trying very hard to find a picture of her on the internet to use in this presentation, I discovered that she, has ret she had retired five years ago. Um, let me tell you, Google stalking your ex-professors is not as easy as you would think. Um, so, you know, she has no idea what I'm up to and, you know, she spent a good 20 hours of her life that she could have spent writing some very interesting treatises on the uh, interplay between secular and ecclesiastical text making in the 14th century in London, uh, which I would find fascinating and I can understand if you would not. And, you know, but th that time she spent with me means that I'm here with all of you today. And so the next time that somebody asks you for help, the next time that someone comes to you and needs assistance, the next time that you're thinking about what to do with those couple of hours that you have spare, um, and hopefully that happens to all of us, and maybe not, but hopefully it does, realize that that speculative investment you make may have far-reaching effects that you may never know of, but that will make the world a better place. So in conclusion, be excellent to each other, and make sure that everyone in your life gets some tacos. <laughs> Thank you. Just, be, just before we get to questions, I wanted to, to let folks just generally know, the reason that I wanted to give this presentation, the reason that it is so incredibly important to me, is I have been to countless uh, conference sessions, the Community Leadership Summit, the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit, 
where there have been discussions about how we're not actually getting enough out of our inputs into these FOSS mentoring programs. And I just basically never wanted to have that conversation again. <laughs> so please take this message and spread it far and wide if you found it useful. Yes? Um, why have you not attempted to contact your old professor and ask what her opinion is? <laughs> not she wasted time? Uh, why have I not contacted my old professor and asked her what uh, her opinion is about whether or not she wasted her time? Well, mostly because I'm a coward and I'm afraid she'd say yes and that would make me very sad because she had a dramatic impact on my life. Um, although I did find her Emerita page on the UC Berkeley website when I was looking for her photo, so I did drop her an email. I haven't heard back and I hope that I do. I don't think, even if you said no clearly because you didn't go into my field of study and I wasted my time with you, I think the whole purpose of your talk indicates that clearly she's wrong. Um, and that if she does come back to you and say, I'm so disappointed you didn't keep doing ancient lit, listen to yourself. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Actually, I've decided that once we uh, get every problem in the open source world solved, so in 23, 22, but that's cool, the singularity will be here by then, um, I'm going to go back and uh, get myself a carol in the Bodleian Library and hang out and touch White Cliff Bibles all day, and that will be very exciting for me. See, the eyes are glazing over. This is why I spend all my time with you. <laughs> I know how it feels. It's nap time. It's nap time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so basically, I wanted to say something about the fact you said, um, you know, the this sucks button. Mm -hmm. Now, I have something against that because okay. you're not taking into account the fact that uh, motivation is what drives most contributors. Mm -hmm. um, as long as I would like to know what is wrong in my project, uh, I don't want contributor to be like, okay, I'm, I'm actually a long-term contributor, I know all that, all that. But new bots are very less likely to stay around or to contribute to open source again mm -hmm. if they are discouraged from that. Right. So I think that this idea uh, is not very good to spread around because we have to take into account that people are doing this in their free time. Mm -hmm. If you get criticized, maybe by, I mean, you perfectly know because you, I mean, you've seen a lot of that. This sucks, usually it's not this sucks because, but this sucks, you suck. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point of the quest, the, the, the fact. So I would be very strongly against that. What's your opinion? I don't actually necessarily know that we should implement a this sucks button. Um, of course, but it's the message. I, so I think that I take a very different view um, of the subject. So if I could summarize, and please let me know if it's accurate. Your argument is that opening a channel or encouraging uh, critical behavior of folks uh, and fr of free software projects for issues that new contributors or in fact anyone finds in them is going to create a culture in which the project uh, maintainers are demotivated because those folks aren't necessarily helping them to solve the problem, but they're very free with their criticism. Is that correct? Okay. Pardon? My question to the question the question, can you really get e Well, I mean, this is exactly why I don't care about that, because I see a lot of people running away from it. So, I mean, if you are right, I get that, and this is why. So, I mean, so when do you get to the deputy project guy? <laughs> Gentlemen, if I could actually actually respond to the question. I think this is a good dialogue, but I'd like us to have it in just a moment. Um, the argument that I would make is that constructive criticism always has value. And the, the important part here is if someone is providing you with non-constructive criticism, by all means, let them know, I don't find your criticism to be constructive, therefore I cannot help to fix the problem that you are seeing because... Well, frankly, I'm just sort of sitting here feeling a bit peeved at how you've addressed me, and that's not giving me the cycles I need to actually fix the problem. So, yes, but Dale? So I would argue that this has button is entirely reasonable, so long as what it does, it pops up the URL to wherever the source code repository is, for that bit of the component. I mean, that's a very reasonable understand the distinction between a this sucks button and a you suck button. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the problem here, here. we have a lot of our mailing list discussions, is that sadly the combination of the limitations of the electronics communications medium where we don't all know each other and we aren't always mm -hmm. treating each other excellently is that 
we too easily cross the line from talking about the thing that sucks to assuming that it's because the person sucks. Mm -hmm. And this is where the harm comes. And so I'm totally with you. I think we have to be very careful about this, but I think it is possible to structure it in a way that you can get even you know simple negative feedback mm -hmm. and get it in a way that it's focused right. on the topic and not the person. Right, absolutely. And I would also I would also argue that um, the kinds of dialogues that we can tend to get into online because we're not necessarily effectively communicating well with each other, where it turns from this situation is suboptimal to there is something wrong with you personally. Um, I've actually diffused situations like that personally quite effectively by saying, wow, I didn't realize that I was such a bummer. Why do you spend your time with me? Right? <laughs> and then it's like, oh, hey, maybe I should think of that through a little bit more and reframe my discussion as let's actually solve the problem. Yes, Josh. I was curious, a lot of the advice that you provided seems very directly applicable to kind of one-on-one -on -one mentoring situations mm -hmm. or project mentoring. What kinds of specific changes do you think you could do to implement this in like large-scale mentoring programs of the handful that we have? So the question is, a lot of the advice that I'm providing seems to be relevant to one-on-one -on -one mentoring, um, either in person or online, and what could be done to make this more effective for larger scale mentoring programs. How could we apply the things you're saying sure. to large scale programs in particular? Absolutely. So I think that there's a couple of different ways that I would apply it. Um, one, I cannot stress this enough. I, um, I think that the most important thing that we can do is actually for all of our free software projects have office hours. Three hours a week, try and distribute it across time zones. If you're not actually having contributors all over the world, you might want to realize that you want to concentrate your office hours in the places where your contributors actually are and then move out from there to make yourself highly available. And people can be on IRC for an hour even if they're at work, typically. Um, and just, again, larger scale, just and, and actually have posted on the front page of your website, are you new to this project? That's great. We would like to hear from you. We're online during these hours. Click here to add this to your calendar. Click here to join using Mibit, for example, or the, the Freenode web client. I think that that would be very helpful. Um, in terms of other ways to apply this to large-scale mentoring programs, this is really about a, a personal change about how we as individuals think about mentoring. I think that particularly in the structure of programs like Summer of Code or Google Code In, people feel like since it is such a, an awesome thing to do, that they can go into it expecting these awesome, spectacular results because Summer of Code and Google Code are highly visible, right? And they're a great way for projects to get public relations and people looking at them, using their code base, et cetera. The expectation that that creates in our heads, I think, is disproportional to what we can expect in terms of raw output. And then that's just a matter of us as individuals sort of resetting our own expectations. Yes? But also, isn't it true that a large scale mentoring program is just a larger scale collection of one to one mentoring interactions? I mean, to me, at mm -hmm. least, the word mentoring fundamentally means that kind of one to one or one to small interaction. Mm -hmm. We are talking about one to many, and it's not mentoring anymore, it's training. Or it's broadcast. Or broadcast or mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I think that one of the things that, the, one of the ways that I like to look at it is, I, I actually think having pods of mentors is highly effective. It, it helps to break down a lot of um, newbie fears. So a lot of newbies are concerned about posting a patch to the mailing list because they're going to be embarrassed when they get feedback on it and someone says their code isn't as great as they want it to be. Um, or you know they just don't want to talk on the mailing list. They only want to talk to their mentor. I hear this over and over again. My mentor, my mentee will only talk to me and not to anybody else. And I think actually having a, a small group of people assigned to each student is actually much more highly effective because then they get the idea of socialization within the project, and that multiple people are responsible for multiple different aspects of the project, be that documentation, different parts of the code base, etc. And that helps to better acclimate them, and also takes the pressure off the mentor. So they don't feel like they're going to be the single point of failure if they aren't highly available or necessarily available at any one time. Just one second, Julian, you're next, and then that hand, yes, sir, and then number three. I was going to say about the, the mailing list thing, specifically you brought up, most of patches to mailing list. Some people, that, that doesn't phase them. Um, in some cases, they've actually read the mailing list people, and they may well be quite scared off. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, a lot of the mentoring process has to be, even in an ad hoc, 
has to be how you respond to people who matter to your madness. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer on the deputy job of madness because it is a complete waste of my time. Um, there are other projects that I'm involved in with similarly sized, similar volume that have a completely different ethos simply mm -hmm. because of the way that people respond. And people will respond in kind. Mm -hmm. So if, that, if the, the way that madness works is that stupid questions are ignored mm -hmm. rather than inflamed mm -hmm. or there are, there are a number of different ways to do it, but it's got to do with a cultural shift, and that's what I see the mentoring part is to a large degree, is that you have to lead by example and mm -hmm. try, and, try and encourage an inclusive management structure or, or project structure. In Absolutely. And I would, even, I would even take that a step further, and I would, um, again, suggestions for, for ways to apply some of these concepts to larger scale mentoring programs. If you can, I would actually institute on-call rotation. So this week, it is your job to respond to the stupid questions. Because what's a stupid question to you is very likely not a stupid question to whoever sent it. They didn't, no one's going to take the time to figure out where to find your mailing list, subscribe to the mailing list, hit the confirm link, and then hit send if it's not important to them. And it may very well be that the response is something along the lines of, Yes, I understand that you're looking for a PHP-based content management system on the Debian development list. That's probably not an effective use of your time, <laughs> right? Um, yes, Julian, and then? Um, what about instead of having a group of mentors from MT as the mentor, deliberately ensuring that whenever you're asked a question that is best answered by somebody else, you reply and try and bring another person to thread to mm -hmm. have the, try and get the mentee um, engaging with more of the community in somewhat of a directed, isolated way that they can then be more comfortable. I absolutely agree with that. I think that in some ways, um, I would actually encourage that behavior on list and actually specifically call out the folks who need to in the re in, you know in a reply all fashion. And that's simply because I think that um, one one of the things that we teach our mentees is how to confront situations where they're afraid or when they don't know what they're doing and they're uncomfortable. And how many of us are much more successful in life when we learn to face our own discomfort, push through it, and succeed? Um, however, I agree that directing folks to the right person to ask and very explicitly saying, you know, Sarah, could you please answer this question about such and such feature? I think, you know, you're the person who, who wrote it, so you'd actually be the best person possible to answer this question is a very effective way to get that dialogue. Continuing. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I think there's a uh, story of the concept here. Mm -hmm. um, you have I would argue that the problem, the initial problem that you have is what the heck is going on around here, but I think that's just splitting hair, so I'm going to respectfully agree with your opinion. Um, I also would argue that, um, have folks here heard of the Dreamwith project? The, awesome. So would anyone like to tell the, the audience what the Dreamwith project is? Yeah, please. Awesome. So the Dream With Project is, is cool for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is um, it has 75% female contributors. But one of the things that they do, and, and I advocate for this greatly, is they have a welcome wagon. They have an assigned person whose job it is simply to say, oh, hey, I haven't, you know, oh, you're new here. Um, it's really great to see you. If you're looking for documentation, it's here. If you wanted to talk to somebody about uh, you know, bug fixes, you can talk to this person over here. You can just ask me any questions you want. Oh, where do you live? Oh, that's great. Hey, I love Pittsburgh. There's this great sandwich shop down the street from you that you should try out, right? Just having that social point of contact. Sometimes we call these people community managers because we are good with the humans. Um, is an excellent way to help bring people into the project, help them get acclimated in that way that you're talking about before they get to the point where their question is about, so, my code isn't compiling, now what? And I get this error message that when I paste into Google has no search return results and I'm pretty sure that something from you know, the seventh circle of hell has now invaded my machine, what do I do? Uh, brick it, <laughs> brick it. excellent. 
take out the power cord. Yes? Absolutely. So mentoring across cultures, surprise, surprise, is hard. Um, it really highly depends on, on who's being paired. So for example, um, in Asian cultures, the receipt of criticism is taken very, very harshly. If a superior criticizes your work, you are shamed and you wish to remove yourself from that situation immediately because you have been shamed in front of your superior. So asking someone who comes from a cultural background like that to create code and send it to a mailing list where it will then be corrected, because that is the project's process, is a really horrifying experience, right? So, and people are hesitant to do that, or they submit a patch and they receive a review, and because the review can, says there are errors, they simply disappear, right? I think that the best way to mitigate that is, um, well, first of all, we all need more peace, love, and understanding because I'm a hippie. Um, two, there are some really great books about business etiquette in various um, specific countries or in specific regions. If mentoring is important to you or you have folks uh, in your project from uh, many different cultures, many different geographical distributions, go pick up some of those books and read through them and then when you have questions about stuff that you read that is, is foreign to you, it's a great time to start a dialogue with people in your project so you can better understand how you can help them be successful in their work by you know meeting them halfway. Yes, Josh. Useful search term suggestion on that point: high context culture, low context culture. I'm just to understand some of people who approach problems differently than mm -hmm. you do. High context culture, low context culture. I wish Danny was still here. She just introduced me to this concept on Monday at the Hacks and Mini Conf. So the idea is. In a high context culture, you have a very small social circle and your interactions with those folks are extremely important to you. Whereas for us, we tend to have a low context culture. We have many, many relationships, some of which are very deep and some of which are very shallow, but we're willing to make use of all of those connections. So when you're dealing with someone who's from a high context culture, um, and they're, for example, your mentee, they're going to want to focus most, if not all, of their energy on communicating with you because that's the valued relationship, not with the wider community. Whereas in free software, we're talking about the wider community. Everyone here has an opportunity to give <coughs> input. Everyone is contributing to the dialogue, and there's, there's kind of that mismatch. So um, I intend to read up on it more, and I would absolutely encourage other folks to do that. I'm, How are I'm we doing on time? Somehow out of time. It happens. So Okay. We have less than one minute in case there is a priority one question. P1 question, yes. Do you find that that high context, low context is age dependent as well? That's an excellent question. Do I find that the high context versus low context is age dependent? Um, I have no idea, but I'm going to think about that a lot more. In training, um, a lot of older people will, but if you say, look it up. Mm -hmm find out on the net. If you tell them something, you're God, mm -hmm. and you've told them the absolute truth. Whereas if you say, find out, mm -hmm. Yeah, then you're being impolite. I actually think that's a really interesting question because I spent so much time with my grandmother when I was young that I think that I tend to have more of that, how could you possibly tell someone to go look it up? That's unkind. Don't, why don't you want to help them? And I never really thought that maybe that had to do with kind of how I was socialized in that regard. All right, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it has been a pleasure to spend time with all of you. Have a round of applause. Thank you everyone on behalf of LCA team this year. We have a little gift for Leslie. Namaste. Please, a round of applause again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.